Welcome to the Strategy Mom Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I have two very special guests. I have the one, the only, Mr. Terry Lancaster. What and up, yo? <laughs> what up, Terry? And I have the oh-so-famous... George, Georges, also known as Gorgeous, yeah. Georges, George, Gorgeous, George, George. <laughs> All of the above, correct. All of the above. <laughs> hey, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today. Hey, Glad for, to be here, man. Thanks for having us, Jace. This is going yeah, to be here, a Jay. lot of fun. Hey, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now and, you know, don't know how you two fine gentlemen got started in the automotive industry, I thought it'd be cool to kind of kick off today's podcast with a couple origin stories. So, uh, Terry, I'll start with you and then George, I'll ask you the same question. How did you get started, Terry, in this crazy uh, little world we call the automotive industry? I was working at a radio station in a double wide trailer on top of a mountain in Monterey, Tennessee, when I, well, as a disc jockey. And when, when I realized that all the uh, the people who made any money at the radio station sold advertising. So I decided I was going to start selling advertising. And uh, as soon as I graduated from college, I got a job selling advertising. And first place I walked into was, uh, was a Ford dealership who practically threw me out. Didn't want to hear none of my nonsense. So I went across the street to a Mazda store and took over the town with, uh, with, with the radio advertising. We ended up running that Ford dealer out of business and uh, they, put a, they put a new dealer in that place. And I, I went and started his advertising, turned him into the number one, uh, number one Ford dealer in North Mississippi. So I've been working with car dealerships for decades. And a few years ago, I decided that the most important way to, uh, to reach more people was, uh, was, was through your people. And that was the way advertising was going. The internet has made everyone, uh, every, every individual, their own radio station. So that's what I've been doing lately is helping individual salespeople become their own broadcast station to, uh, to reach more people, make more friends and sell more cars. That's awesome. Hey, uh, George, for yourself, now how did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry? Well, my situation is not as uh, exciting as uh, Terry's. I wasn't hanging off the top of a mountain or anything like that. But uh, uh, I actually started, I wanted to get into sports marketing, ironically enough. And I was interviewing at a company um, that had an opportunity for somebody in the sports marketing department because at the time, uh, the Ford Motor Company was a client of um, theirs and they had just entered into a sponsorship agreement with the Toronto Raptors. And uh, they were looking for somebody to manage the relationship between the Toronto Raptors and uh, the Ford Motor Company. And of course, uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I walked in for the interview and to make a long story short, um, the person that was interviewing me, who was the president of the company at the time, said, um, tell me what you know about basketball and how that relates to a car. And uh, my story was good enough that I got the job. Um, and over a couple of separate interviews, we actually drove to the Toronto Raptors office. This is before we actually had a handshake. He had asked me to put together a list of promotional um, possibilities for the Ford Motor Company to use in stadium and out of stadium. And when we went and presented to the VP of marketing at um, the Toronto Raptors, he came back and said, uh, I love all these ideas. So then as I hopped back into the car with him, uh, on the way back to the office, he reached over and shook my hand and he said, the good news is you got the job. And I said, great, but we haven't talked about anything yet. So what does that mean? And 25 years later, Jason, lots of opportunity. Uh, I've led um, agencies, uh, traditional agencies uh, on the automotive side, um, uh, several different agencies with several different OEMs. Um, and I've been fortunate to, uh, and now I fell in love. We, we've all fallen in love with the uh, automotive industry. And of course, retail and automotive is unlike any other. It truly is. You know, I find a lot of people in our industry either literally fall into it or are born into it. But once it's, once it's in you, it's 
damn hard to get it out of you. Like, I, I mean, I just cannot imagine doing anything else. I mean, I've played in other verticals, but I just... God, I love the car business. <laughs> like it just is what it is. It's that challenge. And Terry, we were talking a little bit about that, you know, off camera. It was just that creating those relationships and being a part of one of the largest purchases that someone's going to make. Um, well, since I got you both on the show today, uh, I'm excited to kind of talk a little bit more about the social element of creating the relationship and then also the marketing element of you know acquiring someone into that funnel so that we have an opportunity to create that relationship i find sometimes when we're talking about you know marketing and acquisition is everything kind of gets bucketed into this one bucket and there's just so many different elements of it so you know terry i'm going to kind of start with you um what does it mean you know to social sell well I, you, you said you love your car business we all love the car business and i'm going to tell you the thing i love the most about the car business and, and most of the people in the car business probably love about the most about the car business is the fact that every human being you've ever met in north america uh in australia new zealand wherever too the virtual 99.99% of every human being you ever met or ever going to meet is going to be a car buyer at some day. The market is huge. The world is a target rich environment and people prefer to buy from people they know, like, and trust. They have, you know, I read an article yesterday that said 87% of all, of all consumers would pay extra for a better consumer experience. And the consumer experience starts long before they walk into the dealership. It starts when they first hear your name or they first meet you. And so people prefer to, would prefer to buy from people they know, like, and trust. 97% of them would prefer to know who they're buying from before they set foot in the dealership because going in to make that second largest purchase is, is scary. And, uh, and car dealers don't have the best reputation. So people avoid it as long as possible unless they have a friend in the car business. And that's what social selling is, to be a friend in the car business before they get ready to make the purchase. So they know who you are before they start shopping. So they know who to call when they're ready to buy. And it's just calling another friend, going in and doing a deal. And, uh, and then you maintain that relationship much longer, a year after the sale when nine out of 10 car buyers can't even remember the name of the person that they bought the car from. You maintain the relationship down the line so you get more reviews, more referrals, and more repeat business to bring it back to the top of the funnel. And I, I hate to say it, but as an industry, I don't think we do a great job of setting up our sales team for that opportunity. I mean, when we look at our marketing messages, I mean, those messages out there aren't like, hey, let's create a relationship, you know, let's let let's um let's help you find that product. No, you know, our marketing messages are huge discounts, low lease rates, one day only. You know, like that doesn't necessarily sound like you want to make a connection with me, but I think the dealerships out there that are executing and executing well realize that that's, if they're going to set up their sales team to create that social relationship, then they, it starts with the marketing. To your point, Terry, you know, um, the the engagement with the dealership starts way before they actually come into the dealership. And that first message they hear on the radio or the first ad they see, you know, um, digitally, that sets the stage and you know george is kind of lead me into my next question for you is you know a lot of dealerships out there when it comes to running the marketing campaigns is kind of like this this one message campaign of just big stuff and that's not necessarily the case so i'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on you know what the message should look like you know to help set up our sales team so that they can socially sell yeah, thank you, Jason. I mean, at the end of the day, it's um, there has to be a different message for each phase in that purchase funnel, right? Um, awareness. It's a completely different message when you are telling people who you are. Um, I mean, you have to let them know who you are. The manufacturers um, don't do a great job for you as an individual dealer from an awareness perspective. Um, so, so you have to make sure that you're making people aware that you're in the community um, and you're, you, you exist. And then when you take it a step below, um, you know, for awareness is, is the consideration phase. 
And the consideration is, tell me why you are better. T tell me why you're better. Um, and, and that needs to be communicated at a different level. It's different than your awareness message. This is your consideration message. Here's why I'm better. And then comes your purchase message, which you had mentioned earlier, Jason. It's about, you know, here's, here's your um, discount. Here's your, um, your financing rate. Um, and that's the message that you're trying to convey or it's uh, family pricing or it's, but those messages are often the ones that hit first. And then there's a disconnect. So it starts with what Terry was saying on the social side, developing that relationship, generating the awareness. That's a separate message. The consideration, tell me why you're better. That's a separate message. And then you've earned the right to say, not only am I better, here's my pricing. No, you're, to you're totally right. I mean, I don't think it's fair that we just smack them across the face with a big discount and expect that's going to be enough that they're actually going to want to create a relationship with me. You know, it's like we, we can't just market at a customer. We need to market to the customer. And Terry, this kind of leads me into my next question for you is, you know, in that consideration phase, we have to tell them why they would want to even create a relationship with us. I mean, Terry, yeah, what, what would you say to that? I mean, what, what, how does a dealership define that? Well, you define that. You define that by talking about the experience that that the customer wants. I mean, what whether you got a twelve thousand dollar discount on your new F one fifties, or whether you're having your one day only sale, that's that's not to that's not the customer's viewpoint. Everything from an individual level and from the dealership level, we need to think about we're in this to serve them, to serve serve, serve the car buyers, and the thing they're looking for is not necessarily the biggest discount. I mean, every, no, one, no one wants to get robbed, but they're looking for that great experience. Eight, like I said, I just read 86% say they would pay extra for a better experience. And the experience they're looking for is fast. They want it done much faster. So if you want to get them in there and slow them down and grind, and grind them for a few extra bucks, that's going to end up hurting the experience. So they want it fast, they want it fun, they want it fair, and they want it friendly, which means another human being. They would prefer to deal with the, the same customer with the same same salesperson through the process. And if that was somebody they already had a relationship with, people who have a prior relationship with their salesperson before they get to the dealership, they close faster, they're more likely to close, they leave bigger grosses, and they give you higher CSI scores. It's a win-win for everybody if you just make more friends. Well, it goes to those, what are those, the three old P's. I remember the three P's when I first started in the business, product, price, and people, right? Yeah. And it, it seems like um, from our marketing perspective, all we focus is on price. But Terry, to your point, people buy and continue to do service and buy with you is because of the people and the product. Um, if you don't, it's not just, it's not so price driven. So George, you know, from a marketer's perspective, you know, I think, you know, people is a big part of the message that we need to put out there. But I think for a lot of dealerships, they just don't know how. Like, how do I market my people? Um, George, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And Terry, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Yeah, it's interesting because when you talk about people, everybody has a different, is a different personality. Um, so, so to market people in general is a difficult thing. I think what you try to market is the overall experience. Um, that people are going to get when they come to your dealership. It's not, it's not, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the individual person because there is a uniqueness to every individual. And it's hard for me as, as a dealer principal to, to um, talk to you about Jason today specifically, or talk to you about Terry specifically today. But I think it's the experience that Terry was hitting on that we can um, leverage and market um, the overall experience, the efficiencies that you are going to actually get by walking through my store and speaking to my salespeople. I know a lot of people today, well, in today's environment, guys, um, it's really about, uh, you know, a lot of this happens online today. I mean, you could literally purchase a car from, from inside your home, but you should still be getting that personalized experience from your dealer. 
So even buying a car from dealer to dealer, their experiences are probably going to be different online. So there's a, there's a special opportunity for dealers uh, right now to create their own individual experiences that are unique to them that will draw customers in um, and generate those opportunities, those lasting opportunities, you know, because we talk about loyalty. So I'm going to get you in the door. Uh, price might get you in the door, um, but the experience is going to keep you there. And, um, and, and that's kind of my, I, I hope I answered that question for you. No, 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 for sure. I mean, Terry, your thoughts, you know, do you, do you market experience, people, or a combination of both? What do you think? Uh, well, I think the people are the experience. I think it's the same thing. I, I, think, we, I think we have a human experience when, when, we're, when we're doing this. So we want it to be a human experience, and that means you have to have humans doing it, not robots, <laughs> right? So there's number one. Fewer robots, more people. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing, uh, the two things you help, you, you teach your salespeople to market themselves. The sales job has changed in nature. We used to, you know, 90% of the, of the, the sales job used to be going out and prospecting and forming the relationships and bringing them in. But now the internet has taken everything away. Everybody knows everything before they get to us. And, uh, salespeople don't market themselves anymore, but, they, but things are flipping around. And the, and the, the salespeople who are dominating are becoming expert marketers. So give your, your, your people the tools and technology to market themselves, to form those relationships, to form those networks that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be fishing from from a little while. The other way, the way you humanize the experience, the way you market your salespeople and bring them kicking and screaming, even if they don't want to, is, is to make video a huge part of the sales process because it humanizes the experience. It's eyeball to eyeball contact. Uh, it's, you, your salespeople can do it one to one and you can take videos of your salespeople and do mass marketing. You can take video profiles of your salespeople and put them on your webpage, use those as many, many marketing materials to, uh, to humanize the element. Just, you know, a hundred years ago, we used to lay out newspaper ads that had the entire sales staff on the, on the bottom, you know, the pictures of the, yeah, but you, you go, you go to most dealers webpage, you go to the team, you go to the team uh, page. There's, there's three pictures that are, that are, that are blank of somebody's name on them. We just don't promote the salespeople. We have lots of opportunity to promote the salespeople and help them promote themselves through the technology we already have. And if we combine that with video and, uh, and push these out, that's a lot of human relationships buying a lot of cars. Now, I'm with you. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think the people do kind of define the experience, but as a dealership, I need to, I feel like as a dealer principal, as a dealership, all right, I need to help them define what that experience is. And, you know, it's that kind of comes down into, you know, what makes your dealership, you know, different than your competitors. And honestly, you know, when I ask that question, and Terry and George, you guys probably get the same stupid answers. You know, I'm family owned. Who the hell cares if you're family owned? Well, you know, I've been in business for 25 years. Well, you know, the, 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 so it was the Hilton family, you know, the, no, no one cares the fact that they're owned by a, a family, you know? So it's like, so, so how does a dealership kind of define, you know, what makes them different for their competitors so that those differences can be translated into an experience? Georgia, I'll start with you. And then Terry, I'll ask you kind of the same question. You know, how do we help a dealership define what differentiates them from their competition? Yeah, great. That's a great question. And, and you know what, there's no silver bullet answer here, right? It's, it's, it's honestly, um, each individual dealership has a uniqueness about them. And it's not their family owned, but there is a narrative. Um, that they all have. There is a uniqueness about them that they all have that needs to be told. And it's, it, 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 that's what's actually going to make people um, come into your dealership specifically. If they are attached somehow to your narrative, to your story, to your people, and we keep coming back to the, the humanization of this. If they're attached somehow, that's why I feel like community involvement for specific dealerships is so important um, to establish those relationships. And whether you're a dealer and you start with sponsorships of little league teams and so on and so forth, those are important. And, and that actually draws and builds your relationship 
and differentiates you from the guy down the street who may not be involved in the community. Um, so there are a number of different ways um, to do that, but you're all individually unique. It's how you communicate that message, I think, that's going to separate you from everybody else. And today, um, a lot of people are doing things right, but many are not doing anything at all. And that is the challenge. Um, there has to be a consistency. So today, everybody's hunkered down because, and, and saying, I don't want to spend any marketing dollars for my social platforms. I don't want to do this. Well, frankly, that's the wrong answer, in my opinion. You need to actually tell people you're open for business. Things have changed. We're not, you know, we're not denying that. But there's a number of ways that we can still generate that experience and exposure of our products and services to you guys. And T Terry already jumped on it with video. I can do a vehicle walk around. I can do, I can show you, you, you bring your car in for service. I can tell you why you need new brakes here. Let me hold up my, my phone camera and FaceTime you and show you why there's uh, some wear and tear. So all those things combined, I think help you accomplish um, that uniqueness about you. So there, but the, the point is that you have to do something. You just can't sit on your hands. Well, you have to define it, right? Yes. You, you can't just let the salespeople define it for you. You can't let the customer define it for you because the customer will define it, right, Terry? I mean, you can go and read reviews and it will straight yeah. up, those within those reviews, it will say good or bad, <laughs> all right? <Yeah. laughs> what made you different from some other from some other company? So Terry, I'd love to get your kind of thoughts on this as well. It's like, you know, how do we help a dealership kind of define what makes them unique or different from their competition? Well, here, here's, the, here's a common misunderstanding about branding and reputation and all of that too. What the business says and what the dealer defines it as doesn't mean squat, right? You can say anything you want. That's not what your brand is. You can call yourself anything you want. That's not what your reputation is. The only thing that matters is what the customer says your reputation is, what the customer says your brand is, what the customer says in those reviews that they're writing everywhere. So that's what you have to manage, not the words that you spit out, but, but the experience that you're actually giving that's creating this, this, this thing that you want to create. And you, you, ha you, have to, you have to manage that. And the only differentiation you're going to have uh, you know, all the, all the, you know, the manufacturers have made all the buildings look the same. Uh, all the advertising sounds the same. All the pricing is the same. They all, they, all, they all come from the same factory. The only thing that only thing that's going to differentiate your store from every other store uh, in, in North America is, is the people who work there and the experience they provide. So that's, that's your only differentiation. And that's the only way that you can manage the, the reputation and what your customer is saying about you. You have to put your people out there and make them happy. You have to build this culture because happy salespeople create happy customers. Happy employees all over keep, create happy customers. And you have to build this thing organically that, 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 that keeps it going so that every time you, you know, you, I, I talk about video, but if the salesperson's a miserable cuss and hates his job and hates his dog and hates his wife and everything else, you don't want him on video, Right. Because he's, he's 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 a miserable cuss on video, the same as he is on person. So you 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 need people who are happy and enjoy their jobs and are ready ready to help people and uh, and then get out there and do it and and sing about it to the wind. If they if they learn that they can they can support themselves and and build their own businesses by by singing your praises, they will sing your praises all day long. No, that that's so true, Terry. I mean, look if we if we don't take the time to at least try to identify or define what we would like our brand to be and i would and i and i say would like because to your point terry we don't define our brand all right our customers and our employees end up defining our brand but we got to give them direction we got to give them the all right you know look you know our brand is going to be about speed okay that's cool yeah. you know so we have to empower the team so that they know from an operations perspective this is fast all right, we do things quick. We're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do the test drive. We're gonna do the trade appraisal, and we're gonna do, you know, the the nut the payment presentation all at the exact same time, because <laughs> we're trying to make everything quick. But I think that's where dealerships kind of get stuck is that they don't at least define how they want to be presented as a brand. And then what ends up happening to both of you guys' points is that, 
you know, customer just ends up doing it, right? Now, I, I go back to this, and I, I would feel, and I did as a dealer principal, that the agency I was working with should be assisting me with this. But I got to be honest with you, you know, most agencies um, that work with dealerships, I usually hear this one stupid question get asked every single month. What do you want to advertise? I'm like, what, what do you mean what I want to advertise? I, I feel like, like, and, and I'm on the agency side, so I can do a little tough love here. And George, you are too, you know? Like, I mean, I think I got to, you know, break some agency balls out there a little bit and say, come on, guys. Like, I mean, we need to be doing a better job for our clients. Terry and George, you guys have both, you know, defined what a customer cares about and then that experience. But then I look at every single bloody ad out there, and I very seldomly ever see an ad about the experience. So here's what I would here's a question I have for you guys, and it's about agency. It's like, what uh, what are three things should every dealership do to hold a digital marketing agency accountable? All right, to support their brand efforts. George, I'll start with you. Then Terry, I'll kind of ask you the same question. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. So, uh, so one more time, three things. All right, an agency or a dealership should be doing to hold their agency accountable, you know, to support their branding efforts. Well, I uh, so three. So let me start with one. Let me get one out of uh, <laughs> if I can here. Um, so one is they need to develop if we're talking about so so it's interesting if we're talking about branding I think we would rather in this particular case in the context of this um, podcast we're talking about the experience um, so so the experience the overall experience is how do you get that message across are you getting it across so from a creative perspective what does that look like. From a copy perspective, what does that look like? From a deployment perspective in terms of tactics, which tactics are we utilizing? And ultimately how you hold them accountable is whatever tactics you're utilizing, the proof is in the numbers, um, guys, at the end of the day. Let's see how many eyeballs were on this thing. Are we doing some social posts? Are we doing some uh, television ads? Are we doing like radio spots? The numbers actually um, don't lie. It, that's uh, age-old data. We've we've all used that, right? So, and to me, that is first and foremost in in terms of holding an agency accountable. Now, there are certain things that come into play that you have to realize. So, today's environment is different than it was three months ago, six months ago, a year ago. So you have to take those fa factors into account. But we also know by now, if over the last three months you haven't changed your messages and your approach and your tactics, you're lost. Um, so you, you know, from an agency perspective, you really have to step up your game and bring the solutions that are required for today's environment. And you guys know the automotive industry changes so quickly. It's literally daily because you're trying to keep up to your manufacturers too, right? GM will come out with an offer. Ford has to match or do better. Um, all the manufacturers kind of fall in line from there. I mean, you see that on a, on a daily basis. Somebody drops a rate, you know, we've got to do it too. Um, so, so, so again, I, I don't know whether I managed to sneak three in there, Jason. Oh, you definitely got uh, a I think couple, I kind of so. snuck, <laughs> I, I, I snuck them all in there at the same time. Um, but, uh, but that's really, um, it, that's really important is really to hold them accountable to measurement uh, in the current environment. You're, you're totally right. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I've gone to a bunch of dealerships websites and it looks like nothing's changed during this entire time. You know, nothing's changed for them whatsoever. And I, it's just, I think a lot of it just kind of has to do with lazy agencies. Terry, what's your thoughts on, you know, look, we, we talked a lot about the importance of the brand, the importance of the experience how do we hold our agencies accountable to ensure that they are actually um, executing on those messages? 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take uh, take trouble with your, your premise. I'm not sure it's the agency that we need to hold accountable. Be- because because as an agency, uh, as I, if I'm producing advertising for a dealership, or even if I'm a salesperson selling for that dealership and promoting, promoting myself to my own audience and doing my own Facebook Lives and doing my own thing, um, the message that I have to deliver has to come from the dealership. I, if, if, I own, if, if I own an agency and I go to the dealer and go, my research proves that the uh, re- research proves that uh, customers would much prefer to be in and out in under an hour. We need to advertise, you know, we're, we're closing the deal. One hour, one price, one person, the whole nine yards. We're, 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 we're fast. We're fast, fun, friendly, and fair. But we need to hammer this speed element. And meanwhile, that dealership works on the old school where they got to go through three boxes to get everybody through and they're going to spend two hours in finance and they're going to spend two hours before they ever, ever even get to finance and, and they, they don't function that way, then that's, that's incongruous. There's a disconnect there between what we're advertising. So, so the, the, the message has to come from the culture. That's where the experience comes in. You have to create an experience worth talking about. If you want people to share your story, give them a story worthy of the tale. Yeah, just to add to that, if I could, Jay, um, really what I think the dealership has to define for the agency is what the objectives are. Um, And if you can define to me what your objectives are, I'm going to build a strategy and tactics that will support and ultimately attain the objectives that you're telling me. That's what my agency experience is. I am the so-called expert from an agency perspective that's going to generate the results, but I need to know what your objectives are. um, And, and, and then I can actually help build a marketing plan um, and strategy. um, And, and then the executional tactics fall out of that. Right. No, that's totally true. I mean, think about this. How can we, come up with a how do we get there if we don't know where we're going (laughs) and and i see that happen a lot i mean you know we're talking about branding we're talking about sales you know we're talking about sales people's um you know personal development like if there's not a goal actually in mind then what we end up doing is just execute on good ideas and um i don't know about you guys but i hate good ideas um, because good ideas don't usually root in some type of true goal and objective. So well, why is this? I mean, Terry, you know, you've been in the business, George, you've been in the business for a long time. As an industry, why do we find it so difficult to actually be able to sit down and create real goal and objectives outside of, I just want to sell more cars? <laughs> Terry, I'll, I'll start with you. But because that's the only objective we've ever talked about. That's what we told the salesperson on the first day when he got hired at the dealership. That's what the general manager told him when he when he promoted him to sales manager. That's what he was told when he went to general sales manager. That's what they're told every Saturday when they have when they had the meeting. That's what the manufacturer tells them the day after the month closes when they're trying to get the numbers. That's what the money's based on. That's what the bonuses are based on. That's what the incentives are based on. That's what whether the dealership fails or succeeds is based on. That's all we talk about because that's all we talk about. <laughs> It's been done that way for a hundred years, <laughs> and uh, that's the challenge, uh, Jay. That it's 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 always. But how many times have you ever gotten in, into a conversation with a dealer, dealer principal, salesperson, anybody? So why do you do it this way? Because that's the only way it's ever been done. We've been doing it the same way for a hundred years, and that's why in today's world, in in the, the in this COVID pandemic era that we live in, it's so challenging for them because they have to do things differently. And it's a challenge for them. You know, um, you know, some dealerships were closed, like the showrooms were closed, but I still wanna generate sales. Well, you can't do it the same way. So, so how do you evolve that? And that is the, the challenge. Um, so, so, you know, good ideas are good ideas, Jay, to your point, um, but without an objective and a strategy, and, and I'm, I'm in line with sales actually conquers all. There are no issues if you hit your numbers. Um, I'm all for that, but today, hitting numbers today is different than it was uh, three months ago, um, you know, 
six months ago. Well, that's because I think we're just totally stuck on this whole volume thing. And I blame the manufacturers for this 100%. I mean, when I first started in the business, volume was important. Profitability was everything. And uh, I mean, Terry, you started in the business early enough to remember that a happy customer paid more. That's the bottom line. Yeah, and, you, and it's still true. Right? It, it, it's still true. So at what point in time did, as an industry, we shift to say, I don't give a shit how happy my customer is. All right, I just want to sell you know, volume. And then, damn, we're looking at the profitability per transaction. We're going, what the hell happened? <laughs> so, so how yeah, do we go then, back then, to that? Then you're then you're telling your salespeople, hey, we need we need to sell more accessories. We need to sell more. We need to upsell other areas because the profitability has gone away. Um, it's a, it's a great great question, Jason. It's a it's a it's a fundamental thing that's it's a fundamental shift for many OEMs. Um, yeah, and, and dealers, uh, you know, the, the whole volume thing is uh, is an interesting uh, concept. But we, we got to make I, them happy. Sorry, go ahead, Terry. Yeah. And, I don't, and I don't think it's accidental. I think it's a conspiracy. I'll put on my tinfoil <laughs> hat. I've said it before. I, th I think the manufacturers and the giant third-party corporations, they don't care if there's any profit in the car. They're, they're, they're about the volume. They're, they're about, like Carvana. Carvana doesn't sell cars. Carvana sells stock. General Motors sells stock. They're all they're all pushing to get a stock bonus, and uh, you know if they can, if I think they see the potential to drive the dealer system out of the equation, do it all digital retailing straight from the manufacturer. What do we need a dealer for that for? So we got to lie, we got we've got to ruin this business model so that they can't make a living, and uh, and then we'll have the whole pie to ourselves. I think that's the plan. I like that. I'm going to be for that. I think I need a T-shirt of that uh, of that conspiracy theory. We have to come up a name for it. <laughs> but but no, like let's let's say look, there's some people, there's some dealerships out there that are, right now that are listening and watching to this, and they're shaking their heads and they're agreeing with us that you know the goal should be to create happy customers. Um, but I think it's been such a long time as an industry to say that has been our ultimate goal and objective that we got away from even understanding what does that mean. So I would like to hear kind of your, both of you guys' thoughts on what does it mean, right, to create a happy customer. Terry, I'll start with you, and then George, I'll ask you the same question. Happy customer goes home and tells other people about what a great job you did. That's a happy customer. You, you don't have a happy customer and, and, until they're, a, they're an evangelist. And, you know, I, we just bought a car the other day. My wife bought a car uh, and she came home and w was perfectly content, was in and out, telling, uh, had, had a great time. The salesperson, you know, was, was, was super polite, got everything she wanted. You know, a year ago, my, bought, my daughter bought a car, had a horrible experience and has bad mouthed that dealership at every chance she gets. So uh, a, ha a happy customer is one who drives home happy and is, and, is, and is spreading the word about you because cars don't come in one, cars come in pairs. My daughter got a car last year. My wife got a car this year. I'll probably get a car next year. You, you can't sell one car to a household. They come in pairs and you have to, you, you have to organically grow that. And uh, so the first dealership didn't have a happy customer because they didn't get the second car. We'll see how the new car, new dealership does. <laughs> and, and you know what I'm finding right now is that, you know, like my neighbor just picked up a truck and he bought it in April. I mean, literally right in the thick of it, right? And he had to do over 85% of the transaction online. And, um, you know, he said it was his eighth car or something like that he's bought. He was like, it was the best experience I've ever had. And you know, I just, of course, I had to ask why. Well, A, I didn't have to spend four and a half hours in a dealership. All right. Well, okay. Well, that definitely helps, you know, and B, it was on my time, my schedule. You know, I talked to the sales manager on the phone. We talked to, we did a video chat. Then when I had time, I did a video chat with the F and I manager. Like it was on that time. So I'm almost finding right now the pandemic, and this kind of sounds all crazy, has actually generated happier customers because as an industry, we're forced to actually now create an experience and a process that the customer wants, not what necessarily what we want, because we just want to come in the door. The customer wants to be able to engage the way they want to. And in a lot of cases, that's from home, because now that's the way we're just used to engaging when it comes to retail. George, I'd love to get your kind of thoughts, though, on like, how do we generate a happy customer? So I, I got to agree with Terry uh, on this one point in particular, and I'm just sharing my own experience. When I bought my last car, 
uh, I had such a pleasant experience with my dealership. And of course, I loved my car. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought my car. Um, I went back and I immediately shared that with my neighbor. It's, it's the power of referral, um, which is incredible. And no matter, you know, we, as a marketer, <laughs> that, that there's, there's no better ROI than somebody actually telling somebody else or sharing their experience with somebody else. And when you're in market, go there, see this person, you'll be taken care of. Tell them I sent you, it, you'll be taken care of. There is nothing better. A happy customer will sell, you know, 10 cars at a time versus, um, you know, you spending thousands of dollars marketing to individuals to get 10 different people inside that dealership. It is incredible the power of a happy customer. And your overall experience, dealership experience, whether it's in today's marketplace, Jay, where a lot of things happen online or whether it's inside the dealership and how you're treated. But I think the customer is also demanding the way they wanna be treated today. I think they walk in the door and say, because I've already done my research online and say, I want this car and I want these wheels and I want this price. Can you do it? And if the person says, well, come and sit with me and kind of beats around the bush or whatever, they're like, ah, oh, I don't get a warm and fuzzy. I need a warm and fuzzy. But if somebody says, absolutely, let's, let's go through this thing. Um, and they're happy. So they're demand, you know, customers today are, are demanding to, to buy cars on their terms um, because they've done the research. And if you're able to deliver for the most part on customers' terms and they love that experience, they'll be back. Their kids are going to be uh, buying cars. You know, they, they trust mom and dad's opinion. They're going to go in there. Um, that's just the way it is. So um, customer happiness is so important and it costs nothing but effort. That's what it is. It's effort. And you know what? Right now, given the current situation, it's the effort that we're putting into it. You know, um, there is no magic pill that we can sell dealers, even though I wish there was, that will help them sell more cars. All right. We are going to have to process our way to profitability. And that is actually building process around creating relationships. I mean, kicking it old school, the way I started selling cars, right? It is building a process around our marketing. It's not enough just to slap an ad out there that says big discounts. Like the customer needs to know what that experience is. And I think, I know it sounds weird, but it's a silver lining, you know, this pandemic has pushed us now back into an age where the happy customer is our goal and objective. And I think moving forward, you know, a lot of dealerships are getting, you know, comfortable with operating however they're able to operate based on where they are in the world or the country, you know, and the focus should be happy. It should be how to create a happy customer. And I think we're going to be getting away from I, dealerships right now. I know the ones I'm talking to, like they don't care what their volume is. They care what their profitability is. And they know the happier the customer, the more profitability it is. Now, guys, I know it's getting towards the tail end of our conversation. I'm sure we can jam a lot longer. So I get to ask my last question of the day and I prepared you before. So I have big expectations here. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> All right. Mr. Terry Lancaster, your final question of the day is, what is pissing Terry off? <laughs> well, I tell you, Jason, I, um, and this is why I don't get invited on podcast. People hate this um, because I don't get pissed off. <laughs> I, 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 I don't get pissed off, man. I'm, 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 I'm water off a duck's back, baby. Every day above ground is a good day. I'm going to make the best of whatever the situation is, come hell or high water. And uh, me getting pissed off about something, I'm going to do nothing but raise my blood pressure, and I don't need to raise my blood pressure. So I'm going to do what I got to do, let everything else take care of itself. So doesn't 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 take care of much podcast fodder, but uh, uh, I, I, guess, I guess I'm pissed off because I don't get pissed off enough. There we go. I think mean, that's great. 
Terry just is pissed off because he doesn't get pissed off enough. All right, George, I know you well enough. I know there's something pissing you off. So, <laughs> Mr. George Georges, what is pissing I, I, you off? So, so this is a little bit of a personal thing, but I'm pissed off because I can't be at my cottage right now doing this live from my cottage because it's under renovation. And uh, I have to wait uh, another week and a half, so I'm told, according to the contractor, before I can step in. So that is what's pissing me off. I should be doing this with the big lake in the background, but I'm not. Well, I think that would piss me off too. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now and would love to connect with you fine gentlemen, what is the best way to do so? Terry, I'll start with you. So, uh, so number one, if you want to know anything about Terry, go ask Google. Google knows everything there is to know about Terry. I can't hide from the mafia because uh, it's all right there. So, uh, so Google Terry Lancaster. And if you're, uh, you, you work at the dealership, go ahead and text the word Terry. Text Terry to 33777. I'll, I'll send you an introductory bio, my little video about me, and I'll uh, help you uh, figure out a way to tell the world about you. That's very cool. Hey, uh, George, for yourself, what is the best way to connect with you? Uh, you can connect with me either through our um, company website, which is vitumus.com, uh, or you can send me an email at gjorgis at vitumus.com. That's the best uh, way to connect with me, and I'm happy to, uh, to chat, answer any questions, um, and, and just talk about the industry. We started saying we're super, we're all passionate about it. It's, we bleed it. It's in our blood. Um, happy to, happy to chat about it anytime. Awesome. Hey, thanks guys for taking the time to jam with me today. This has been a lot of fun. Great. Thanks for having us. Thanks.